So this talk is very informal, so feel free to interrupt me, uh, particularly since I have not been here for the previous part of the course, so I don't know exactly what you guys have learned. But I looked at your syllabus, and I on purpose try to adjust my talk to complement that. But if there's things that I assume you know, raise your hand or ask me afterward and say, I don't know what you're talking about, and that's no problem. Um, so I run a lab at Wisconsin that really is all about what this course is about. Our passion is fluorescence. So you'll hear these fancy terms like we say we're the laboratory for optical and computational instrumentation. All that means is we're developing technology to look at our biological focus, which when you, if you go to our webpage or if you see my talk, it may seem like we're all over the map. You'll see like we look at prostate cancer, a lot of work in breast cancer, stem cells, basic development in C. elegans. Uh, we do work with uh, uh, with uh, aging, uh, muscular dystrophy, and so you think, these guys are all over the map. We're all these things that they do. It seems like it's not a common focus. But it is because our passion is to develop technology for one thing, which is looking at live cells. We want to see what cells do. So we're interested in disorders or normal processes where cells are fundamental. And as you'll see, because we want to look at live cells in realistic dimensions in their natural environment, it really dictates what we can do. It means that a lot of imaging methods that you've heard about, maybe less so in this course, but in other backgrounds, things like MRI and PETs and electron microscopy, just don't work for us. As I'll talk about, your favorite imaging method for your project really is defined by the biology. For what we do, it's cell resolution, which I'll talk more about. So we're a fairly funded center. We develop a lot of software and a lot of hardware. And then applications. I decided for today's talk, looking at the uh, syllabus and after Gabby's suggestion, I'm going to focus a little more on the com computational tools. Um, so I'm going to gloss over some of my optical and biological work. I'll give examples, but I won't go heavy duty into it just because there's other people in this course that are doing that. But if you're interested in it, let me know and I'll be around during the breaks and part of lunch to talk if you're interested in any of it. So what we do, as I said, we develop uh, optical instrumentation, so that can be new types of laser scanning station. It can be multi-photon, fluorescence lifetime. We do adaptive optics, like I think the speaker in two uh, uh, slots is going to talk about, to go deeper in live samples and cancer. We do FRET and fluorescence lifetime that you heard about in demos from ISS of that, I believe. And then a big part of our group is better software. We're trying to develop open source approaches to capture this data, to visualize it, to share it. That could be everything from really exciting ways of rendering it, three-dimensional visualizing it, to more kind of boring things like how do you store it? How do you disseminate it? How do you get it to other people? How do we talk a common language? So there's 150 microscopy formats out there. How do I know if I read your data that I understand it because you use one platform, I use another. And that's a big interest of ours. So the field that we're in we call bioimage informatics. It basically is the informatics of the bioimage. And it's building on bioinformatics, and I'll explain that. But it really is its own discipline. And these are the core areas they call cyberfrastructure. I actually got this from Wikipedia on the left. These are all common things you see in any scientific field. Uh, and yet, what's kind of cool is that in our field, we use these and we have examples. So I won't have time to talk about all these, but one thing is you need software for acquiring the data set. And uh, uh, one thing I should point out is almost everything I'm talking about is open source. It's not that I'm anti-commercial software. It's just the same way that you want open protocols and share. Open source code, not only is it free, which is advantageous many times, but it also means you know what happened to your image. You can trace what happened to it. And most commercial platforms actually came out of academic labs. So the ability to track and see what happens is really important. So data acquisition can be tools for software or digital capture. It can be commercial tools, such as Metamorph, uh, such as LSM scan and so on, but also can be free software like Micromanager. If you're not familiar with that, it's a really powerful package for uh, acquiring data from any light microscope. It's free, you can download it, and uh, I encourage you to look at that if you're interested. Data storage, this is mostly hardware, so basically approaches to be able to store and s share your data. Uh, one of the days that any PI dreads is when a student leaves the lab because you're trying to figure out what to do with all their data and what the long-term future of it. And unfortunately, many times the birth of a data set is when it's acquired and the death of a data set is when it's published. And that's scary. What it means is that when you publish a data set, you put out, get the paper out there, the raw data often goes goodbye. And there's a big controversy in the field about how to deal with that, which I won't have time to talk about today. And then there's data management. Uh, image database, which so we'll talk about ways of sharing your data, putting your data into databases to be able to share with yourself, your PI, your collaborators, and so on. And the data integration, which is uh, a relatively new idea, the idea of trying to link genotype with phenotype. You're acquiring this data not as its own self-standing data set necessarily, but you're acquiring it as part of an overall story. You want to know what's happening. The reason that we do fluorescence, you know, I often tell when I teach uh, younger students, I always talk about it being genetic paintball, right? That you have the ability to label all these genes. We do that because we want to get after function. We want to be able to link uh, the code to the function, and that's really exciting. And yet, until recently, we've done a very poor job of that. We've 
fluorescently tag all these organisms. Most of the genomes are finished. And yet normally the genomic data really stands apart from the image data. There isn't good database linking. And so recently there's a project launched called the Cell Center Database out of Mark Ellsman's lab that's trying to actually deal with that, trying to link this data. And then data mining, which is a relatively new idea, most for drug discovery, the idea that you could develop pipelines and workflows where you could pull up a thousand images and say, I want to run all these steps on these and develop workflows or, pi or pipelines, they call them, on this. And then data viz, which I will show a few examples of, that could be everything from the very famous examples of 3D rendering to segmentation. How many of you guys know about segmentation? You guys ever done that? A little bit? Okay. So the idea that you can actually look at a data set, tell components apart based on properties of them and, and categorize them. And then cell tracking and 3D rendering. So the basis of this field really is bioinformatics. Uh, and bioinformatics, unfortunately, normally has meant genotype, which is why we decided to coin about 30 of us in the field, decided to make image informatics its own area. But it's really based on the same idea that bioinformatics is all about the need for biologists, computer scientists, and information technology folks to get together to deal with the full lifespan of a data set and all the components on the previous page. And in particular, dealing with the same thing, which is developing new algorithms, uh, the same way that in bioinformatics you need to actually do statistical analysis, we do the same thing in imaging, analyzing different types of data, including even genomic data in our case, trying to actually look at expression, form and function compared to uh, code and, uh, and type, and then develop implementation tools that allow efficient access and management of different types of data, heterogeneous data management, and I'll talk about that today. So this field uh, is very specialized. So bioinformatics is the idea of coupling uh, computational biology and bioinformatics. It leverages computer science more on the applied side, so it's not necessarily about developing algorithms per se, but about harnessing those. And uh, I will say that's really biased on biophotonics, which is largely what this course is about. You know, when you think about image informatics, of course, there's a lot of other type of bioinformatics like crystallography, electron microscopy, structural biology. But for the most part, when people think of bioinformatics, it really is about the cell. And again, that's just because of the importance of the cell in cancer and other diseases. And then it can be large scale, high throughput. The idea is it can be heterogeneous image and related metadata. And what that means, I have a few slides about this, is that your data can be more than just you see your naked eye. Sure, there's the, there's the image itself, there's the structure, but as I have in a few slides, there's all this other non-spatial information, some that you can't see with your naked eye and how to map that. And then metadata might be a new term to you. This is everything like in your notebook. This is anything other than the pixel data. So why you acquired it, who you are, what the microscope is capable of, that's all metadata. And you cannot actually analyze any raw data set without metadata. People often wonder, why do I care about metadata? It's actually incredibly important, because metadata even tells you what the pixel per micron is, even the scale of your data set, that's all metadata. Only the raw pixels is not metadata, so you really need metadata. Uh, and the novel image processing techniques, which I'll talk a bit about, and the field is in really rapid growth. Just because we're in an amazing time, the last 15 years I've been in the field, I've just seen this great transformation from going not only completely digital, I remember we were mostly using analog when I started, but now with the digital, we have less compromise. It used to be that when I was doing a long-term uh, run, I remember having to stop the microscope because I just ran out of RAM. Just was not enough RAM. Now you can acquire as much data as you want. There's less compromise. You can go longer, faster, deeper into samples with less compromise. So it's pretty exciting, more colors as well and so on. So I should say that, again, we're really focused on optical high resolution, and that's all because we want to study things at the cell level. However, there is great opportunity, and we're realizing this in the field, that we really should be reaching out to other modalities, in particular to electron microscopy. You know, electron microscopy is actually my original training. I always remind students not to forget that technique, because there's a lot of excitement about super resolution microscopy, you know, STED and STORM, which you may have heard about in this course. But don't forget that electron microscopy is the original super resolution microscopy. And if you really want to get high res, it's amazing what it can do. And then medical informatics, we're finding there's a lot of things we can learn from that field, particularly as we're getting more into cancer imaging and working with folks like Steve Bopart and others who's talked in this course, we realize there's opportunity to link our kind of data to more medical data, things that are ultrasound, OCT, and so on. And then uh, I want to time to talk about it, but a lot of the tools that we use in our lab were stolen from other fields. The technique that we actually used to look at breast cancer, analyzing the structure of breast cancer, actually came from uh, looking at ocean floors called curvelets. The techniques we use in astronomy for some of our rendering techniques all came from fly-through weather gimmicks the weathermen used to do. So we actually do a lot of different techniques, borrow and steal from other fields. So I won't go through this because I think you guys have had this probably uh, random into your head in this course, what biophotonics is. I just want to point out, though, that the exciting thing about biophotonics 
is that it's not passive. Biophotonics is more than just looking at the image. It's the opportunity to manipulate. So the reason people use biophotonics rather than just calling it a light microscopy is there's a possibility and an opportunity, and people are doing this, to use it more than just a microscope. You can actually be able to do things like LASIK surgery on a cell, essentially, be able to ablate holes, be able to do things on the cell, and be able to do it maybe through a fiber optic, not use a microscope at all. And so that's why it's really important. I think the most important definition of this page is the idea that it's the interaction between biological items and photons, so it's that general. So it doesn't have to be a microscope, and it doesn't have to be just passively visualizing it. It can be manipulating the microenvironment. Uh, this slide is actually one of my favorite slides, which might reveal a lot about my personality. But the, what's cool about, I think, imaging, and also a problem, is that imaging folks are very, very biased and very excited about their favorite imaging technique. And too often, you'll have someone like me that gets up and tells you the very best technique out there is, for example, multi-photon, fluorescence lifetime microscopy, or someone else will say OCT is the way to go, or ultrasound is the way to go. And one take-home message when you think about analysis or imaging is really realizing it's all about resolution. So in the course of your career, anytime you hear a talk or anytime you think about an approach for your, uh, for your imaging, don't get sucked into which imaging method is better. Think of which imaging method is better for my problem. And any imaging method you've heard about, whether 20 or 30 or 40 out there, you can select it based on resolution. It's the temporal resolution, so how fast you need to acquire, it can be live or dead. It's the spatial resolution and what elements do you need to see. So do you see it in 3D, but also at what resolution do I'm looking at things that are organs? If I look at things at an organ level, I can't use techniques like multiphotonical focal. They don't give me the resolution I need. But if I want to look at things that are cell-based, so micron or smaller, techniques like multiphoton are very good. But if I want to get really true nanometer scale where I'm looking 50, 100 nanometers, then I really need to be looking at electron microscopy. So your favorite methods can be defined by that. The reason that we use light microscopy in this whole session is about light cell microscopy is that because we want to look at cells when they're alive. That means that the only method that works is light microscopy. EM is fixed, won't work. MRI, CT is just not high to resolution enough. So the only method that's capable of looking at micron, submicron features over time and space is light microscopy. So to give you a little bit of biology uh, that we do in our lab, we can use this anywhere from looking at spectral data, so trying to look at what happens at the different spectra. So these are two different spectral maps of the same data, different wavelengths. Data can have different dimensions based on what spectral wavelengths you have, and so you can separate that. And so spectral readouts are really interesting. And I think you might have a spectral, I know a couple in the Beckman, spectral instruments like the Zeiss Meta and Zeiss Big and so on. Uh, fluorescence, Imaging can often be just as simple as I just want to watch it over time. So my favorite type of imaging is just watch development. So for example, watching a worm, in this case, an early embryo, watch it go from an embryo, one cell embryo, like we all start, to becoming a multi-cell embryo, and then a worm actually squiggling on the stage of the microscope. We can do that. We can watch it, do fluorescence. So sometimes just long-term watching, I'll show a couple of examples of stem cells later, where we just watch them go for an hour or so, or 12 hours overnight. And then lifetime imaging, which I think you have heard about lifetime. Okay. So fluorescence lifetime, again, it's really exciting. For the first time, we can do things that before really required blender-like approaches in biochemistry, things you had to do in the cuvette. But now we have the ability to actually look at things in a dish and do the same kind of understanding of the biochemical, the microenvironment, but do that actually in vivo. And we're finding that cells, it matters. I won't have time to talk about this too much, but with cells, you can't just look at them flat on a glass slide. Well, you can, but it's not as realistic. We're finding that them being in 3D and their microenvironment matters. Same way that you guys can influence me, because you're in my microenvironment, the same way that cells are influencing their microenvironment. And studying me in a, in, a, in a white room with no interaction is not who I am, but studying me as I do my job is. And so same thing with cells, you need to see their natural microenvironment. And then have you guys heard about harmonic imaging at all? Has that been discussed? Second harmonic? A little bit? Okay. I see one nod <laughs> from Gabby. <laughs> um, hopefully you guys heard about that, but I'll talk about it. But did they? All right, all right. Um, well, harmonic is one of my favorite techniques, and I actually, on purpose, am not really going to talk about much because I saw it was on your syllabus, but if you have questions, let me know. But it's a, it's a terrific, powerful technique, and it's an example, uh, similar to some of Gabby's other research, to be able to exploit natural occurring optical phenomena and be able to harness that. And I'll give some, a few examples, but I won't explain the theory, but if you want me to, I can. 
but actually this is an example of us doing that. So there's actually cancer cells invading a matrix and this white fibers here are actually collagen fibers. And so the idea is that collagen has this, because of a centrosymmetric structure, it has this um, a harmonic property that we can exploit. It's not fluorescence, it's something that we can do with it and we can watch invading cells. So the opportunities and challenges when you think about informatics or quantitative imaging in general, is it really is opportunities and challenges, is that you have the ability to combine all these different uh, techniques that you couldn't do before, different kinds of scanning approaches, lasers and detectors, less compromise I mentioned, different ways of acquiring the data, scanning approaches, even some at runtime analysis, different ways of analyzing the analysis, uh, deconvolution, other kinds of approaches that you can do. And then we find that combining these things in new ways is really yielding more information, but it also could yield more frustration if you're not careful. And that's something we'll talk about. And then there's also opportunity really emerging from many labs, including Steve Bopart and others, that you can use this for biomedical applications. So we actually, for the first time, I never thought I would see the day that I did a human trial. I'm actually now doing human trials with our equipment, looking at breast cancer. Others that have made more fiber-based systems are actually actively working on patients. So there's a lot of opportunity for <laughs> biomedical applications. I thought I would put this slide in because I wanted to just tell you, I think you've covered all these techniques in this course, so don't, you don't have to read through all this. But I just wanted to give you some idea of all the techniques that are available just in my lab, and I think most of you have in your lab, or certainly at the Beckman. So when you think about all the tools available to you, you have all these different imaging modalities. And so, uh, and of course, this is biased towards light microscopy, but you can have bright field, DIC. You guys study DIC? Differential interference contrast? Or Nomarski? Okay. Again, I see two nods. <laughs> And uh, phase necroscopy, confocal, which you've heard about, point scanning, spinning disc, sweat field approaches, then multi-photon, which you've heard a lot about, nonlinear optics, cars, OCT, which I think you'll hear more about. And then there's the detection side, all different types of contrast, everything from the same way that a stage can be lit up by a good stage hand, different ways of lighting up the stage, white field lighting, intensity, which you've heard about fluorescence, of course, spectra and lifetime. Uh, you guys heard about FRET? Right? So the idea that, so, that uh, proteins can interact based on their fluorescence. And you can measure it like an internal ruler, harmonic, which we just talked about, polarization states, which you've, which you've heard about, and then ways of being high throughput, looking at many, many uh, cells and, and uh, specimens in a, a multi-wall dishes. And then optical manipulation, you know, being able to actually manipulate the cell, be able to blast holes in it, be able to turn on proteins, and then post-collection processing methods, which I'll talk about. So the point of all this, just think about the dizzying array of things that you can do to acquire an image and analyze it. How do you keep track of all that? So informatics is fundamental. You have to have it. And so that's why it's both a challenge and an opportunity. And to give you some idea, these are all the things, in my opinion, that one can do with an optical microscope. So when you often think of an optical microscope, people think of this microscope that you peer in, you see a light bulb, and you see bright light, and you see an image, and that's it. But there's a lot more going on there, as you know now in this course, and probably from your own previous experience is that, of course, you can look at dynamics. So you can have microscopes that allow you, for example, to look at a live embryo and how it develops and, and contrast, how it changes over time. You can look at the structure. So you can see it in three dimensions and see what it's doing in a natural environment. You can look at the, the properties of the fluorescence. You can look at the chemistry of it. So you can look at fluorescence spectra and the lifetime. And then more recently, this is work that uh, Gabby does as well, is you can look at the physics and the physics of the sample, the microenvironment, and the fluorescence is really an untapped frontier. We've barely scratched the surface of what you can do. And this is exciting, that you can actually uh, get things with the microenvironment that traditionally you thought would be quantitative cues that you could only get through more invasive procedures. And what's exciting about these four categories, dynamics, chemistry, physics, and structure, is they can all be done at once. They all complement each other, and they all can be done in an intact live cell developing in a real environment. We're even doing this in the animals where we actually put in glass windows into a rat or a mouse. We can peer into it, watch it over a course of a year and get this kind of information, all without the animal not knowing that we're, do knowing we're doing it. So a naturally live animal model, so it's pretty exciting. And to do this, of course you need hardware, but really these last three are really what you really need. You need software to acquire the image, of course, and then ways of visualizing it and data managing it. And some of these modalities, like you heard about lifetime, you can't see without software. There's nothing for you to look at with your naked eye. It requires software to map back to it. So let's dive into some of the, uh, the issues of quantitation. So I won't have time to talk all about, but I want to give you kind of a broad strokes uh, approach first, then I'll discuss some specific tools that we're involved in developing and that are available to you, I think, 
uh, from my point of view, might be useful for you in your studies uh, and your research. So the image problem is one that we often talk about. And uh, since I'm a kind of an optimistic, I often call it the image opportunity, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the idea is that we want to look at this kind of beautiful image of cell division and what's going on there. So traditionally, the field of microscopy has gotten the rap that we're a field that is about pretty pictures. And to be honest, we still like our pretty pictures. We like our calendars, and we like our, we like complementing functional information, and genomics, and biochemistry. But the field, as this title of session is uh, suggests, has become really, really quantitative. The more quantitative you get, you got to start approaching your data sets differently. You got to be more careful about how you're mapping your data, how you're sharing it. If you're trying to be quantitative and you're trying to say that this color means something and the amount of that red means something, you need to be careful how you're labeling it, how you're tracking it, how you're sharing, what's known about it. And uh, let me just, you can hear me echoing here. Uh, and try to figure out what information you want to collect. Is this image more than an image, is it a quantitative data set? And the answer is yes. There's information that's quantitative that requires informatics. And if you look at all the types of fluorescence-based data, whether it's luminescence fluorescence in live animals, pathology data sets, in vivo work through an endoscope, drug validation, organelle, cell work, all these things are pretty pictures, but they're also measurements. So where are we at? Well, I'm biased, of course, but you know, we always talk about that we're really in the golden age of optical microscopy. So we have the ability now that we have a growing library of fluorophores. We have microscopes that can uh, deal with spectral information, hyperspectral, be able to correlate space and spectra, deal with complex fluorescence phenomena like fluorescence lifetime, like spectra, like harmonic. And you, you can fuse these methods. You can have one microscope, which is one right there that can do all this, in this case a multi-photon microscope. But you also have the ability of having practical systems where you cannot work with live cells. I remember it used to be really difficult to get fluorescence into a cell to be able, it was a big deal if you could keep a worm alive or cells alive on a stage of a microscope. You had to figure out CO2 levels and temperature. To be on the point now where these things are pretty trivial. It's pretty easy to keep cells alive for long periods of time. It's very easy to have techniques that don't kill the cells, don't bleach them. And it's very easy to collect large amounts of data. Uh, you know, the computer is not the bottleneck like it used to be. At one time it was the bottleneck. And so you can have high throughput systems like the Opera where you can do long term imaging very quickly in multi wells and get information about content very quickly and fewer trade offs. It used to be that if you wanted high content, you maybe had a compromise on resolution. And if you wanted high resolution, you maybe had to go slower. And if you were collecting a lot of high resolution, big data and high content, you had to acquire for less time. But now is the case where I can collect four channels of a 1,000 uh, point time data set at 1024 by 768 with fluorescence lifetime and have uh, 30 focal planes. I can do that. It's not a big deal. It's standard on all the time. And so that's a huge change in the field. And the kind of information that we can get is imaging, of course. And that's exciting because it's really the only way that you can get spatial and temporal information all together. So you get the spatial and then the time lapse together. And also be able to actually have markers that would, could preserve the relationships of both spatial and function. And so you have the ability, pretty novel way, of being able to look at function over time and space. And so of course, there's a lot of advantages this approach. It means that we have fewer experiments, also fewer animals. When I first started doing this work, every time we would do, for example, a cancer study, every time point was a sacrificed animal. Now we realize we can have one animal, we can watch it through a window, for example, through its entire lifespan, because the surgeries are not turnable, the animal's alive the whole time. And so faster understanding, not only is that better for the animal research, but it's also a faster path to system understanding. The more that you're 3D, the more that you're realistic, the more you're looking at intact environments, the easier it is to extrapolate to higher systems and be able to make those correlations. And then of course, with the building now, everything is automated. So it used to be that it was a big deal to have automated stages and Z motors and focuses, but it's not anymore. Everything is automated. Very easy to do automated discovery. And this is us going crazy with PowerPoint, but basically one of the real interests in the field is of course we want to get measurements about structure and dynamics of structure, so space over time. We want to be able to look at these functional markers like fluorescence and be able to see the relationships. But the real dream is to actually try to look at the relationship between function, structure, and time, dynamics all together, and how did that come to be. And we can do that. Really, light microscopy is the only methodology to do that. And so that's what we're after. And that's why we need a measurement rather than just a pretty picture. But of course, there's challenges, some which I will only be able to cover briefly in, in this talk. But there's the complexity of the data. The, it's a challenge in that 
your brain wasn't set up to visualize this type of data. You're dealing with these huge mass of data sets in multi dimensions. And the fact that it's visual and quantitative, the fact that there's numbers there and there is a, uh, an image is hard to deal with. The fact that it is not only space and time, but it also can have other dimensions like fluorescence lifetime spectra. And the fact that it changes so much uh, in the morphology and over time, right? So it's, tra it's hard to track all that. And given the amount of data sets for practical reasons, you often need to be find ways of being able to reduce the data set. It used to be it was for the purposes of allowing you to animate more quickly, allowing the computer to catch up, but now it's to allow your brain to, to uh, manage that. Imagine if I were to throw at you a common data set that you could have like a 16 channel data set that has a thousand time points, 30 focal planes, and maybe has correlative lifetime data as well. If I gave all the data to you and said, okay, look at it all together and tell me what you think, it'd be hard for your head to get a wrap around that. But you could look at the time dimension first, look at it spatially, look at one channel at a time, or turn some channels on or off. And that's what reduction methods allow you to do. You're not pitching anything. You're just allowing you to sift and roam through the data and having you be in charge. And of course, there's a problem with sheer volume of data. I would say that this problem, though, is not what people often think. People think the challenge is disk space. Well, to be honest, disk space is not the problem anymore. We could buy lots of disk space, it's cheap. You can get terabytes for nothing now. The problem isn't the, isn't the physical storage of the data, it's the amount of data as far as how to share it, how to figure out what to do with it. And it's the data mining of it, and the data means something rather than just being a lot of disk space. So that's the challenge. And also long-term archival is still an issue. And then of course, how, what type of measurements do you want to do? How do I relate structure, function, dynamics of a data set? And how do you profile that kind of data? So I'll show you a few examples of the kind of data from my lab and what we do in quantitative analysis. So it sounds like you guys have all heard about fluorescence lifetime, so I won't dwell on it. But basically, we want to look at a data set like this. So this is a, a cancer data set. This is a GTPA called Rho GAP cancer cells, and they're invading a collagen matrix. So this is a breast cancer cell line that I put into a 3D gel, and this collaboration with our one of our copii is Patty Keeley, and we want to actually understand what happens when invading cancer cells get into a 3D gel. We found the behavior was completely different if we had them flat in a glass. So the traditional cell research is you have a slide or you have a glass dish and you, you coat that with fibronectin or something and you watch the cells crawl along. But we find that we put them in a 3D gel, and collagen, actually the breast is mostly made up of collagen. We find that we can approximate the breast and we actually can uh, watch these cells interact in there. And, but we wanted to see more than just a pretty image. We wanted to actually see if there was cues in this data set, in this GFP row, that were different binding domains. So an example where you can look at fluorescence lifetime. And so fluorescence lifetime is looking at every pixel of that data set and saying, tell me how long the fluorescence stays in the excited state. And as you learned about, this is a classic quantitative data set, is if all it was was a fixed number, let's say that GFP had the same fluorescence lifetime no matter where you looked, it'd be pretty handy to tell things apart. And I could say that uh, the GFP has this lifetime and M cherry or rhodamine has this lifetime. I could use it as a way of telling apart fluorophores the same way you use spectro. And I'd often talk about the idea that this can be the fluorescence of the, of the fingerprint of the fluorophore, so getting after its identity. But that would be of some interest, but perhaps not given the amount of har money the hardware costs and the analysis. Is it worth it? Because you normally can tell from emission, excitation of what a, what a, fluoro what a fluorophore is. It's even more exciting than that, that the lifetime of a fluorophore isn't always the same. It's dependent upon things in the microenvironment. So for example, proximity of other fluorophores, like FRET, uh, things like uh, pH, hydrophobic regions. So it's more exciting than my normal fingerprint. Imagine if my fingerprint not only told you who I was, but told you that I'm talking to you here versus downstairs, or I'm talking to you guys versus talking to Gabby. There are different types of interactions. That's one of the holy grails of biology, is if we have a way of non-invasively looking at interactions and saying what's going inside the cell. Before fluoroseptic came around, we didn't really have a way of non-invasively looking at a live cell or live animal and saying how far apart are two proteins, or who's doing what, or is there a pH or hydrophobic region, is it near a membrane? This allows you to do that, and uh, a long time to talk about it, but to me it's one of the more important quantitative imaging data sets out there. It's not perfect, it's got a lot of problems, it's difficult to analyze, which I'll briefly describe here, but it also has problems that you can't tell what caused it, so you need other information. So I can't tell you, I can tell you all these things affect the fingerprint, but I can't tell you which one by itself resulted in it. I can't tell you if it was pH or hydrophobic, I need some other information about the biology to tell you that. So that's the drawback. So basically the problem though is if you collect all these photons every pixel, you end up with a huge spreadsheet of data. Well, I could take that spreadsheet and say, okay, there you go, that's your fluorescence lifetime data. But well, how would you map 
how it looks. And also, how would you know the numbers are real? How would you know that those values they got weren't because of something else going wrong, like, like someone shining a flashlight in the room and the detector picking it up, or a problem with the board itself that does the photo counting, or even like in our room, we have an exit sign for the fire guy that won't let us take it down. It's right nearby, and sometimes it gets picked up by the detector, right? So all these different errors. The same way when you measure radiation, you want to measure background radiation to make sure what you're measuring isn't something already there. So what we can do is take that big spreadsheet of numbers and we can exponentially curve it for a goodness of fit, statistically making sure the values are good and throwing out ones that are not. But then this green curve here is we can collect the, uh, the background. This actually is where we put on a sample. In this case, we put on a harmonic sample. Give you starch. Harmonic is not fluorescence. So we can see it, our scope will activate it. But it's instantaneous because it's scattering another phenomenon. It has no uh, decay. So we can actually instantaneously get an image, but with no lifetime. And so with that image, we can look at it and we'll still have a lifetime, which you see here. And that's due to errors in the cable length of the system, problems with the board, room lights being on me, part of the experiment, and so on. And then we can use it part of our analysis. So now we have good fit data, but to visualize it, we can map it to color. This color scale, all these numbers. And then take that color scale and superimpose it back. And there you get your lifetime image. So lifetime can be a really important way to see function. And to give you kind of one example, we can use this to look at uh, 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 breast cancer cells. In this case, looking at two cell lines, a normal cell line and a cancer cell line. This is one of the beautiful things, which I haven't had a chance to talk about, is one of the exciting things about biology is that the same way that we can look at fluorescence of GFP that came from jellyfish, our body has its own jellyfish GFPs. And our body, things like tryptophan, elastin, collagen, NDH, FAD, poropofins, these are all things that glow in your body. For the most part, they're the bane of the cell biologists. When I was in grad school, I hated them. I didn't want to work with these things because I wanted to look at my GFP. This stuff we just called autofluorescence. And a lot of these techniques you've heard about, spectral mixing and spectral techniques, were all to get rid of autofluorescence. But as we got more clinically oriented and also better at understanding fluorescence, we realized the same way that GFP is important to jellyfish and important for us to exploit in human cell lines, we can take advantage of the intrinsic fluorescence in our bodies. And it has huge clinical potential because it means we don't have to add fluorescence. And I don't think anybody in this room wants to become a transgenic human. And uh, I don't think anybody does. And uh, basically, this is a way of actually exploiting fluorescence in cells. And you can see the kind of beautiful images you get. These cells, you can see there the nuclei and all the, auto, all the autofluorescence. Not only do we get these beautiful images, so nothing was done to these. These are cells that come right from your skin. If you take a bit of epithelial skin, you get those kind of images. But what's exciting about it, not only is it an intrinsic biomarker, allows you to see fluorescence and cell resolution. You can map cells and mark cells without any adding any fluorophores. But it's even more important that most of the proteins you look at are important. NADH is an incredibly important metabolite. So what we want to do in this study, I'm only going to briefly talk about it, I think it's an exciting one, is say, can we look at fluorescence lifetime to better understand NADH? And how many of you guys have heard of the Warburg effect? So the Warburg effect is this really interesting idea that cancer cells, when they get more starved in their tougher environments, they become even more aggressive. They have ways of shifting their pathways like glycolysis where they can keep just trucking. So a normal cell would starve in hypoxia and starve environments, but not a cancer cell. So cancer cells, if you were to look, it's known from biochemistry experiments, that if you were to compare a normal cell line and a cancer cell line in a starved environment, the cancer cell line can keep a more constant metabolism, just keep going through that tough drought period of time, and the uh, normal cell lines won't. Well, we wanted to prove that. So that's known, people could do it in a blender approach, but no one ever will do it in live cells until we and others uh, showed, showed this. We just want to show, can you get the Warburg effect in live cells? So it's a pretty straightforward idea. To do that, you need some way of being able to look at the biochemistry of the fluorophore. Well, as I mentioned, binding is one of the things that affects lifetime. So if we could look at NADH free, not to get too much of the biochemistry, but free and bound NADH is a really important part of the shift to glycolysis. If we could measure the free and bound components of NADH live in a cell and be able to see if there's a difference between that ratio in a normal cell line, so a normal cell line versus a cancer cell line when it's starved, and it, in other words, in a more crowded environment, that would be really powerful. So that's what we did. So for the purposes of Simplicity, you can just ignore the bottom two rows. These are just the ratio, this is just the components, so free and bound. But look at the ratio A2. And so this is a normal cell line. And we're starting off between 10,000 cells to a million cells. And there's a color map on the right. And you can see the colors get quite a bit different from panel A to panel C. You can see that you start off very orange. 
in your ratio and then get much more blue as time goes on. So clearly there's a difference. As you get more crowded, there's a difference in this ratio. And this all forces lifetime in the cells. But if you look at the uh, T47D, the breast cancer cells, you can see that from 10,000 to a million, it's staying pretty constant. And so this is exciting. Now people have been exploiting other models, including stem cells. But it's the idea that you can actually map this progressively, quantitatively. So I'll give you a few other examples of things you can do beyond lifetime. You also could do quantitative work, which is over time and trying to understand 3D relationships. So this is actually looking at, uh, how many of you guys have heard of uh, uh, embryonic stem cells? Right, most people. So stem cells are exciting to understand, particularly if we can understand these early stem cells and understand how they become more specialized cells. We, a lot of excitement, both scientifically and politically, about stem cells. And yet, from my point of view, beyond application, I'm curious, why do they differentiate? How do they become that? What are the cues? There's all this interest about trying to use them. But I also understand why, and many others do too, why do they work that way? How do they become those cues? How do you tell a stem cell to become a more specialized type? So to me, it's a very interesting research data model beyond what you do with it clinically and, uh, and so on. Just as a research model, it's fascinating biology. And so we found that there's the need to understand these things in 3D because embryoid uh, stem cells, they become these clusters of embryoid bodies in 3D. And so we can do studies, in this case, three hours, look at them five minutes apart, 23 sections, and we can reconstruct a 3D body. And so you can see all the elements that make that up. And there's a lot of interest in measuring this and trying to understand over time how does it change and other different levels of interactions. As well, another classic kind of quantitation, which you guys probably have done before, is tracking cells. So in this case, I don't know if you can see it back there, but we're just watching what cells do, how they move around. And on every cell that's moving around, we're tracking it via software. And you can develop automatic tracking algorithms where you basically are developing maps. So it'd be essentially be like, if I want to see your guys' behavior, I had cameras watching you. As you guys walk around today, there'd be little lines following everywhere you want and where you guys go. And uh, you can watch the behavior, and I can watch all day the interaction, which rooms you go to, and what your normal workflow is. That's what you do in cells. And it's all based on software that does that. And this is, a, this is just see the tracks by themselves. So it's incredibly powerful what you can do, and these are using things like uh, segmentation, feature extraction approaches that sounds like you guys have heard about. And then the last uh, biological example before I give a few software things to finish up is that, of course, I mentioned that we're very passionate about harmonic. So harmonic is beautiful. So if you look at, for example, in this case, a, uh, a breast tumor with collagen, you get these amazing images of collagen. I won't have to talk too much about it, but the structure and wave of collagen fibrils, and this is all based on second harmonic and how light interacts with those fibrils. And uh, you can see the tumor. And the thing I want a chance to talk about, though, is that if you look at you know, this beautiful example of a mammary duct here, these collagen fibrils are more than just pretty. They're quantitative. When you look at that going, well, that's attractive, but what does it tell me? What's well, interesting, I don't have time to talk about this, but if we have software, which we do, that can measure every angle of the collagen fibril, we've now done human trials that architecture, collagen alignment, how curvy it is, can tell you about the patient survival rate. We looked at 210 women. We were able to predict with 95% plus uh, accuracy of what survival rate they were gonna be purely based on collagen angle. And the reason is, to get the punchline away, is that it's because it's known that as collagen changes its orientation and becomes more branched out, that's how they invade the body. Metastasis utilizes this as a highway to escape, and we have movies of cells crawling along these fibrils to escape the uh, primary tumor, because what kills you is metastasis, not the tumor. And so that's why we can look at survival rates. So a lot of excitement about that, and that's an example of quantitation as a clinical. And we can use that to look at the boundary. Um, so this is harmonic, looking at the boundary of the tumor. But it's even exciting that we can even combine it with phlegm. And in this case, we're using flesh's lifetime, and the reason it's so blue is that z blue is zero, and uh, collagen doesn't have any lifetime. And uh, so that's why you see that, but things you can do. And then I think I have one image. Yeah, this shows an example I was talking about. If you look at the progression of tumor, just look at these th first three rows here. You will see this change in architecture where you'll start seeing the, uh, the collagen up there. You see that really bright, dense spot? That's the first stage that we find in this uh, tumor associated collagen changes. And we still have software uh, based on curvilets to do this, wavelet approaches. And then step B is start seeing the fibers more branched out. But the really scary step, but here's the tumor, is when the fibers start going like this. And they become these invasion highways where the cells will crawl along them and invade. And we have movies with our collaborator John Candilis showing invasion this way. Okay, 
So I think about 10 minutes left, is that right? Uh, Gabby? Yeah. Okay. So last 10 minutes, I'll give a few software examples. Um, however, I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to try not to dive too much into specific software because I could give a whole two-week class just about software. There's actually about 50 applications just on software, just open source. And uh, uh, so it's a, it's a thing that's on right. Instead, I just want to give you an idea of what the type of tools there are. And I give an overview and realize that it doesn't really matter which application you use as long as you understand the approach. Okay? But one of the really interesting things, kind of overview, is the idea of workflow. So I suspect many of you are in this workflow, my lab certainly is, where you have some sort of digital acquisition system. It could be commercial, metamorph, ecofocal, or whatever, elements. Uh, you acquire the raw data. There's some sort of metadata, and those of you who have done image analysis, well, thank you, uh, have been uh, dealt with this, where you have some sort of metadata, and that's often why your data, you may be frustrated by this. How many of you guys routinely do microscopy? Does everybody do microscopy of some sort? Okay. So, so we, well, you'll get into this. One of the big frustrations of doing microscopy is that you collect a data set and realize nothing can open this thing. So you'll collect a dot, dot .lsm or a metamorph file, SDK, or so on, and you'll try to open it in a browser or paint or Photoshop. It won't open. And that's because of proprietary raw data metadata. And so you usually have to find some way of transforming that data so you can open it and process it. You can visualize that data, get some analysis, for example, like measure mitochondria, and then the result will be you publish, get your degree, and you'll move on, right? And that's what happens. And that's usually the death of the data set. So what I mean by that is that everybody, myself included, when we publish that paper, often those, uh, over time, the risk of that data is still being around or, or, being, or being lost, it gets more and more increased um, just because the expertise is gone. You really, much more so than your PI, you know that data. You know how it was acquired, you know what happened to it. Your PI understands how it fits in. But over time, you forget, your PI forgets, and all is left is the paper you wrote. And the paper doesn't really do your, uh, uh, your data justice. It's only a snapshot of your data. So the, the, the goal in the field is to try to change this. One is to have some sort of standards, some sort of way of preserving this data so that when you actually publish and, and your analyzed data, we keep the raw data. So many times I've seen analyzed data that really throws out the richness of the original data set. So if I collected this beautiful 1,000 time point 32 channel data set and uh, with, with, uh, with 30 focal planes, but of course in a journal, what are they going to do with that? So they're going to take a couple key images. So there'll be four or five 2D images. Five years later, I go back and look at that study the richness is all gone. It's just my chosen view. So what almost everybody does, myself included, when they actually look at an imaging study, is unlike genomics, if I have a regionomics paper, I always email the author and say, can you send me the strain? Very rarely do I remake the strain. In imaging, unfortunately, almost every paper you read, chances are you won't ask the author to send you the raw data. They won't have it. Almost always we redo the imaging, which is a real pity, not only our resources, but I may do it wrong. I may do different approaches or things that I may not know about. So the same way it'd be silly for you to remake every genetic strain, we argue it's really silly not to have the raw image data available too. So we want to change uh, where things are at with that. So the idea is to develop a glue infrastructure, a way of maintaining all this data, kind of a hub for all this data, where you could actually suck in all your raw data. But look carefully at the, uh, at the arrows, that the raw data goes in, and it doesn't go out. It's one way. It's meant to stay in there. And, and then you can do quantitative analysis, but it can go both ways. You can feed out the data from this glue network, and you can feed images into this to do quantitative analysis, but then the results can be stored back in the system. You can do data management and tagging. One of my favorite things is that you could tag, for example, let's say I'm interested in your data set. I could draw circles and notes on your data set without destroying it. It's just overlays, comments. And then you could choose to display them or not display them. So many people could comment on a data set. And you could ask questions this way. And you can have to process data, so again, you can have an analyzed form of the data set that's here and visualize it, but it's all in this network. So we have done this based on a word that I like to use a lot. In fact, I overuse it, and that's interoperability, the idea of trying to have tools talk to each other. And so a big, big interest is trying to have ways of sharing the metadata. So basically, I want to share everything that's in your notebook. You know, what does that mean? So when you talk about this strain, what is that strain? I want to know what laser power, camera setting, uh, floor floor type, I want to know everything about it. And I want to know all the ways that I can communicate with the data set, interact with it, and call other programs. And so if you're interested in this, it's all done through this open microscopy environment that we're part of, and it's openmicroscopy.org. Uh, you can go to and look at. And so I want to use a whole bunch of tools to do this. So I won't time to talk about these, but we have, we'll talk about a few of them. We have tools like bioformats that maybe is maybe the most boring thing our group has ever done. 
but perhaps the highest impact. He's about 40,000 labs, and it's a tool to allow you to open up any format there is that we're aware of. We keep adding more. I think we're up to 120, 140, and keep increasing this and try to deal with all the metadata and raw data and do it faithfully. And then uh, this database that actually can store all the results of the data and then tools like Insight and MSJ that can visualize. And so not to dwell on it, but we have data models that I won't talk about based on XML, similar to HTML, but it's a, an extensible form of HTML. OMI TIFF, which is a TIFF that has the ability to store metadata. This bioformats application, which I'll talk briefly about, and then the OMERA database. So in general, it's the idea of a data model. So it's how you basically faithfully take the results of your data. It's so going back to that picture of a cell, taking that quantity of data measurement and putting it into a form that I can share with others, right? Because if I measure it and I do it in my own proprietary structure, it doesn't matter. I need to be able to do it in an open form. And then having ways to deal with open formats and then a database tool. So I'm not going to talk about these, but if you're interested, we have a web page all about the XML, omexml.org. Again, it's all off of my Craspy. And it basically is a way of preserving all information about the data set, pixel information, instrument settings, notes from the experiment. And there's the Bioformats project that's using about 20 toolkits, including MSJ, that allows you to map proprietary data. And you can see some example of all the data sets here. So all these proprietary formats, and those of you doing my class right now I realize how frustrating that is to deal with all this data. This program does it for you, and then it has all these different color bars that tell you how good it does it and where to get more information. I thought I'd throw in one example. There's one really neat project that uh, uh, there's a journal you may have heard of called Journal of Cell Biology, one of the bigger cell biology journals. They decided to really get on top of this problem. They don't want their, their, their journal articles to be the death of the data set. They actually want to be the, the uh, preservation of that data set. So uh, those of you who submitted a paper have gone through this process of where you take your image and you make it a 300 DPI TIFF. And Luigi C, OMK, there's always rules for publishing, all based on old print standards. You don't give them the raw data. This is the first journal that does this. This journal, when you submit a paper to them, they don't want your, uh, your, uh, your dumbed down data set. They want all your data to get to that. So they have huge server set up, and it's really exciting that when you put data in there, you spend all your raw data. So if you read one of our papers in this journal, you would not only see my snapshot, so they would pull out from that raw data what I want to show you in the figure on the print on the web, but you could see the data set that I got that from and how I did it. Well, the results have been surprising to me. I expected that I would be happy and my colleagues that folks that do biological microscopy analysis would like this. And I knew we would benefit, and it's already happening. This has been a fairly major success story. But there's two other use cases that I think are worth pointing out. One, I've been surprised at how many other fields of interest have been, especially been computer scientists and others that have been starved for raw data access that have been using this. So people that are not interested in the biology of the paper necessarily, or at least how it was presented versus another aspect of the biology, or actually interested just in the data itself from a computational point of view. And the interesting thing has been fraud that unfortunately journals are faced with people doing bad things to images. Loosely, hopefully, not on purpose. They don't understand, for example, which hopefully all of you do, that it'd be really bad for me to look at a color image like this and do one thing to part of it, not the other. You've got to really tell people what you're doing to an image, and you can't threshold and change things on image without telling somebody. Sometimes it's done by accident. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are people out there that do bad stuff to their image, images, and the journals love it because they can tell with raw data. With the raw data, they can tell what you did and catch things if it's inadvertent or on purpose. And either way, fix it, address it. I won't talk about it, but we have a robust database system in the OME environment that can store all your data and keep track of it. That basically allows you all these things where you can organize and view it. And the idea is to be a pipeline where you can link to many other tools. And it gets interoperability, the idea that, uh, how many of you guys have heard of MSJ? What? Oh, excellent. All right. How about Fiji? Curious. Wow. All right. So Fiji is based out of our group, it's part of our collaboration, and I uh, always like to see how much things have spread as far as knowledge. So Fiji, I won't have time to talk about, but it's a distribution of MSJ. But MSJ, we'll talk about uh, quite a bit in the last few minutes. So again, you can do structure annotations. The idea is that you can actually put your image up in, and then also all the associated files of the data set, like PowerPoints and so on. And you can do analysis, where you can actually tag your data set and write notes, and where it came from, and screen through a whole bunch of volumes. So in the last five minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the challenge of image analysis. And one of the things that uh, has become a real challenge is this type of thing. And actually this slide is about probably five years old, I've kept it, because it's interesting that the more and more I wait, the more and more that we tend to do this every day. 
So when I first went five years ago, I'd say it's pretty uncommon. Now we're doing 1024, 1024. But it wasn't so often that I would do 32 channels at each pixel, 30 slices, and 100 time steps all together. It's becoming more common where you have those kind of data sets. And so you can have massive amounts of data. But as I mentioned to you, it used to be the concern about that was really about how to store on disk. You know, 8 gigabytes used to be what a hard drive would have, max, even less than that. And also, it would be very hard to send 80 gigabytes across a wire. But now with 100 megabit and better connections, it's not that big a deal. The challenge is, is the poor biologist. That's a lot of data to deal with. What a pain on how to analyze that and share it and understand it. So we need software as you roam through it. And so, in our opinion, what you want in modern software, and I recommend that you think about this anytime you evaluate any software package, including a commercial toolkit, is what you want it to do. So any package, whether you buy it or download it, you of course want to be able to image things in 2D and 3D, but you want to be able to quickly animate through them. You don't want it to be this choppy thing where you can't upload all of it. If you can't load in the whole data set, what's the point? So you've got to be able to load the whole thing into memory and be able to roam through it. Be able to roam through things in real time. So I want to be able to have good, smooth animation, see all the components. I don't want to have to open one channel at a time. I want to see all the channels there. I want to be able to have you click and choose what you want. So it's basic. I want your data set to be there and you have control of roaming through it. I want a quick way of you lying, be able to go through the non-spatial data. I want you to be able to, for example, open up a lifetime data set and be able to correlate it back to intensity uh, with doing that very easy. And I want to do it on a reasonable memory footprint. The good news is that the computers are keep getting better and better. So reasonable now could be 16, 32 gigs of RAM or more. But even so, you don't want to have to use supercomputers or clusters when we'll do it state of things. So MSJ is a favorite. And if you're interested, we actually have an article coming up about this for the history of this program. This, I believe, probably predates everybody in the room except for me and Gabby. Uh, this is uh, MSJ first came out in uh, 82. 81, and, uh, and uh, this is a application that was really based on work from the uh, 70s. So it's one of the granddaddies of image analysis. It was originally developed to actually scan gels, to look at uh, gel uh, distometry. And uh, it's an excellent program for 2D, but pretty weak when you consider it for 3D and beyond. And for that first one, it's very good for doing basic running 2D and 3D. But if you want to open up large four-dimensional data sets, it does a poor job. And it's also, you know, you can do things like annotation here. So you can see, for example, see how there were being annotated text, but very poor at doing that in three dimensions. So we've been trying to build that in the last two minutes or so. I'll just talk about what we're trying to do. So the reason we do MSJ is because we want to have an open tool to do image processing, which normally means you want to improve the appearance of the image. You want to bring up obscure details in the image, so features, and you want to do quantitative measurements. And the reason you want MSJ it's not that it's the best tool out there. It's the most open, most common tool. So when you download MSJ, you'll be like, well, ask, if you haven't seen it yet, why does Kevin like this tool? I download this thing, it's like this simple little toolbar, and it seems like it doesn't do anything. That's why I recommend Fiji, because Fiji comes pre-packaged, just like a Red Hat to Linux. It comes all preloaded and customized. But whether you use Fiji or MSJ, the point is, is that it has all these modules that you can essentially populate your own Swiss Army knife. You can choose what you want. You can choose which knife, which blade, what it can do. And not only are there developers developing this, like Wayne Raspin, the author, and professional developers in my group, there are amateurs, scientist programmers developing it, which is often the best, because these guys uh, are developing things for their own work, and they might be doing things that only one or two people care about it. But if you're that one or two people, that matters a lot, and so they can develop customize things for your particular measurement. And uh, so it uh, runs on Java, and the real thing about it it's got plugins and macros, and oftentimes I talk to biologists, I mention programming. They're like, well, Kevin says I can do it, but I can't. I'm not a programmer, I can't do it, won't do it. You can. Any one of you, I recommend you try this. Any one of you, how many of you guys know how to program? Okay. Well, those of you that don't know how to program, all of you know how to program, will have no trouble. But let's say that there are a few of you in the room that just hate programming of any type, don't think you can do it. You can in this program because it's got really cool little tricks. My favorite I recommend you try, since it seems like everybody raised their hand but MSJ. Let's say you have a thousand images. You want to do the same process in all your images. It's got this thing called Macro Recorder. It's like a tape recorder for programming. Whatever you do in MSJ it will record it and make a script macro. You can open that script, it's human readable, and you can see how it did it. And then you can adapt it. So I've had people in my group with no program background that really hate computers that have actually been able to very quickly write their own programs, their own analysis. And that's powerful, the ability to be able to do your own analysis in high throughput manner. And so information about the uh, MSJ program is on the website. I really recommend Fiji. We actually have a new website now called Fiji.sc. If you're curious why Fiji, it stands for Fiji is just MSJ. The original developer loved the island Fiji, so he was looking for an excuse to call it Fiji. And so pretty funny. Uh, as again, as I mentioned, the MSJ interface is quite simple. 
basically got these main menus here. There's a few call bonds here. But again, I won't talk about it, but the major analyze things are image, processing, analyze, and plugins, and help. And there's lots of examples. I really recommend Fiji because it is image J. It's just that we went through and we made it basically a version for microscopy, so it comes preloaded. And, uh, Fiji is something that you developed then? So Fiji was developed by a guy named uh, Pavel Tomechek in uh, Dresden. And we've joined the consortium, and now the major developer, Johannes Schlinden, is in our group. And so it's a consortium now that's basically in Madison and, uh, and Dresden. We work together. So the three main things in our group right now are the ImageJ2 project, which is a new version of ImageJ that's underlying Fiji, which is in our group. Uh, ImageJ2 and OME, and these are all uh, consortiums we're part of the Open Microscopy environment. So you can see there's all sub-menus and things you can do. And all sorts of plugins, we'll have to talk about them, but you can see just tons of examples of things you can do with filters and colocalization studies and deconvolution. And you can actually look at your data in 2D and 3D and be able to combine stacks and create rotating views. So you can do a lot with a simple program. And you can do things like variable resolution where you can have a, a smaller resolution data set and a bigger resolution data set uh, to roam through things quickly. It's almost like a video game where you might roam through really quickly through the room and things are a little blurry, but then you stop and things are burned at a high resolution. So there's ways of having faster views. Flexible color mapping, choosing how you map the colors. Being able to do arbitrary slicing, the idea that you can actually choose your data set is normally acquired this way with a confocal scope, but you can choose your own volume. I can be at these different perspectives. So if I want to peer into an embryo, I don't have to be like this. I can be like this. I can be like this. So I can computationally slice it. And then volume rating, of course, trying to do 3D views of a 2D data set. Measurement tools, being able to measure both in 2D and 3D. And so we're developing a version of MSJ that is underlying Fiji that will allow us to deal, as I mentioned, ImageJ is really poor at two-dimensional and beyond, uh, beyond two-dimensional data because it was based on gel. So we've actually, uh, data, so we've actually been extending it. And just to finish up, we're making it so it's extensible and modular. And the idea is that you can actually then connect to other programs. So if you download ImageJ Fiji, not only could you use it for your analysis, but you can connect to many other tools. You can connect to commercial tools. Like for those of you, how many of you heard of Imeris Bitplane? So, no? Okay, well. So BitPlane's a very famous commercial program, very expensive, uh, but very powerful. And it actually talks, even though it's commercial, it talks to ImageA Fiji and can do analysis with it. How many of you guys have heard of MATLAB, probably? MATLAB? Yeah, so MATLAB. MATLAB uh, can be used with this. So MATLAB and ImageJ go very nice together. MATLAB is also Java. So you can actually call ImageJ through MATLAB or you can call MATLAB through ImageJ. So MATLAB brings a lot of power to ImageJ. And uh, so just the last slide. So really what we're trying to do is create a platform in the community, this is a small subset, of being able to talk to many tools like Fiji, MSJ, didn't have time to talk about Farsight and Soul Profiler, MATLAB, and then use Bioformat as a way of getting into this. But the idea, if you're thinking about image analysis, first be aware that you need to preserve your raw data, understand how it's collected, how you stored it, and then think about how you want to analyze it. And think about what kind of quantity of measures do you want to make. Is it just 2D and 3D measurements, spatially? Is it lifetime? And remember that no matter what you do, just make sure that you've got to have careful notes because every process you do, no matter what tool you have, has a danger of being proprietary, even if it's an open toolkit, if you don't record how you did it. And that's the main point of uh, my talk. With that, I will end. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, any questions? How many of you guys are actually doing image analysis right now? Does anybody have any image analysis problems they're running into? Not yet? I'm sure most of the problem. Go ahead. One. All right. What's your problem? You know? Hello? No. No. Mm -hmm. ITK? Yeah, ITK and VTK are another example of great toolkits. So like MATLAB, you can uh, use them by themselves or ImageJ uses them too. For you? Absolutely. So we use a lot of images in my lab, and we mm -hmm. also develop mm -hmm. our own plugins. Mm -hmm. But if we want to use yours, I assume they're somewhere on the website, and we can use Yeah, so uh, everything we have is either on the ImageJ website, but also one of the things we're doing in Fiji, which is kind of a lot of fun, is that there are update sites for a given lab. So if you went into Fiji and downloaded it, you'll see the low site plugins. Probably the biggest one you'll see is our bioformats one, but other plugins we've written. And so that's a new trend. So in the future, for your lab, if you want to, you could set up you know, the Gabby Fiji site, and you can have your own version of Fiji for your lab that has all your plugins preloaded. And so it's a new trend, so. That sounds good. Um, what, uh, can you explain a bit on how you do the cell tracking? What, you know, how? Yeah. 
So uh, there are just a ton of examples of ways of doing it. A lot of our stuff is based on work that uh, Dan Hooser has done at Harvard where we're just doing uh, simple trajectory plots. And we're just actually looking, we're trying to segment the features and then we just watch them in 2D. A bigger interest that we're just starting to get into though is trying to track those in 3D. That's a little harder. The algorithms out there are not quite as well established. There's a, uh, a guy at Milwaukee that we're starting to work with that has done some work on this with uh, Baji Rosam at Farsight. Uh, but a big, when people often talk about tracking, it usually has meant 2D tracking. And a big move in the field is they're more 3D. But most of the algorithms that we use uh, really came out of work in MATLAB. So most of MATLAB based, and Dan Hooser has been a big leader in the field, or work in Baji Rosam's lab, so. If, if you, yeah. So if you go on the image J site, you'll find particle tracker. Okay. And I think what wasn't the Wunder lab one of the developers? Yeah, there's about. Yes, there's students who work with Wunder and EPR. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, there's about. I'm aware right now of about 25 algorithms that are for tracking. So there's a lot out there. In fact, we have a. If you're interested, I have another talk I'm going to hear that I can show you that basically is all about. We do a course at Woods Hole that's all about tracking. And so tracking is a really huge area. Um, and in my work, I don't develop, I just utilize it. So we basically steal, people be develop and use it, but there's a lot out there. And the same thing with uh, segmentation, uh, feature extraction. Uh, Bob Murphy and others have all, P-Slide Project have all sorts of ways of doing it. And so it's, uh, again, the same way that you're choosing which application to use, you need to choose which algorithm gives the best result. Same thing in deconvolution, you know, do you do the nearest neighbor, you need to pick out what is the best approach. And usually I think it's trial and error. So basically trying it. So. Good. How big should they should they be or how big can they be? Should be. So should they be is a great question because I think what you mean by that is that to get really good 3D rendering, you have to have enough slices. So the size of the data set is more of a practical limitation of can you do it, right? So if you get really, really big data sets that are, you know, a thousand time points and, uh, and 85 Z slices, it becomes an issue of rendering to be able to get really good uh, 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 sectioning. But tools like Va 3D and MSJ can do that, uh, Ameris Bitplane. But the bigger issue is being able to get data sets that are high enough fidelity where you believe the 3D result. So if I was trying to reconstruct a live embryo and I'm only collecting four optical planes, that's not enough Z series data. And so you really need to look at your data set and make sure you have enough optical sections, but also the spacing in between them is enough to represent that. So if you want a lot of fine detail, if you're looking at something that changes a lot in Z, you may want to collect less than a micron apart. You might want to be 0.5 microns, you may want to have a lot of slices. If you're looking at something that's more sparse and not changing as much, then maybe five microns apart is good enough. So it really depends on the biology, but it's a good question. That the 3D rendering is only as good as your raw data set. And so the software can only do so much. So. There was a question there? Yeah. Yes. They have analysis with fluorescence, let's say. How do you normally validate that? Like, supposedly, like if you use a protein, how do you know that the amount of protein that you think is there? Like, do you use any, let's say, aspect or? Yeah, it's a terrific question because that's one of the real problems with doing quantitational fluorescence is believing what you see. So that was that problem of that data set because expression levels can be different, right? Different cell lines can express the fluorescence differently. It also could be how well did I make the genetic construct? There's nothing to do with function. So if we're trying to be quantitative, we do need to have good controls. And so there is a lot of work of both the controls for the scope, making sure you're analyzing it correctly, but also knowing that you're stable, your lines are stable and this kind of thing. But as you might be suggesting, there's another problem though. What if I'm trying to use the intensity information to answer a question? And the most common thing is people use it for fret. So one of the big problems, the reason there's so many errors in fret, is that people are trying to actually use these intensity measurements to look at fret interactions, and yet there's variability in the expression that people think means something about the proteins, when it could just be a bad microscopy, problems with the cell lines. So that's why fluorescence lifetime has become very interesting, because it's intensity independent. Uh, and so the idea is that you wouldn't have to be biased by that, by the amount of fluorescence, it's just the interaction. It has its own problems, as you may have heard about, or may have briefly alluded to, but it can be great for that. And so it, it absolutely you need to be aware of that, so. All right, I think uh, 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 Dr. Alicieri will be with us for- Good morning, yeah. For lunch, too, yep. right? Oh, yep, yep. Please, any other questions? We're big fans of the image. If you want to learn about tracking the optimal power right away, we do that in the lab all the time. Thank you so much, Kevin. Yeah, my pleasure.